uh, Tom Blevins. I'm an endocrinologist in Austin, Texas, and I'm at, at a practice called Texas Diabetes and Endocrinology, uh, I'll say, here in Austin. We have three offices, if you know Austin, and North, Middle, South, Round Rock, and South, South Austin. And I, I'm, a, I'm a boarded endocrinologist. That's what I do, cardiometabolic, diabetes, all those things. First of all, I want to talk about how uh, trisepatide or Manjaro works. Now, uh, it, first of all, it is a, it's a single molecule. That's one thing that's really important. It's not some double hook molecule. It's not something that kind of two things stuck together. It's based on uh, GIP. And I'm going to use some terms, I'm, I apologize, but I'm going to define them. And a GIP is glucose-dependent, insulinotropic, polypeptide. And so now you understand why you want to say GIP and not that. I mean, who would want to say that? And you know GLP-1 is glucagon-like peptide 1. And we've been using meds, uh, their GLP-1 meds for a while, like Ozempic, Trulicity, their weeklies, and their they're working for us very well, and we use a lot of them a lot for diabetes. And then you know that Ozempic is approved, it's semaglutide, and it's approved as that drug called Wagovi that's used for overweight, for obesity management. So, new world here. And, and this adds yet another twist to the new world. So it is a new drug class because it has GIP and GLP-1-like effect in one molecule. And it, it's, it's uh, actually novel, and it's, it's a peptide, and it's engineered, and it has, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in, if you like to talk about amino acids, this one has 39 amino acids, and has a, a what's called a fatty diacid moiety. Don't remember that. And, and it has a half-life of about five days, and so it can be given once a week. That's pretty nice, and it's an injection. It's, it's liquid. It doesn't have to be reconstituted, and, and uh, um, it doesn't have to be adjusted to renal or hepatic impairment. It's not met metabolized there. It's kind of nice, too. You don't have to worry about that. Well, w what is this about? Well, GIP receptors are on the beta cells, and they, they actually uh, agonize insulin production. So let me talk about what these two different molecules, I'm sorry, two different uh, receptors do. This is one molecule. That's why I said that, two molecules. See if you're awake and see if you're paying attention there. It's one molecule. Well, what GLP-1 does, and we've known this for a while, uh, it reduces sat appetite, increases satiety, slows down gastric emptying, and, and, and actually stimulates insulin production. That's GLP-1. Remember that, GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1. That's what these, remember, I'm, that's Ozempic, Trulicity, Vidurian, all those. That's what they are. They're GLP-1-only drugs. And they lower glucagon, and they, they actually lower glucagon. Why would, why would that be important? Well, because glucagon stimulates hepatic glucose output, which raises glucose, and you want it to be suppressed in people with diabetes, especially after they eat. So GLP-1, we know a lot about GLP-1. What about GIP? Well, GIP probably does also have some central appetite effect and, and also uh, may reduce body weight in, in and of itself. There's some data that says that GIP, and remember, we're talking about terzepatide. I'm just going to focus again. Terzepatide, now called Manjaro, actually has effects on both GIP and GLP-1. And the GIP part makes it very unique. Let's talk about the data that got terzepatide. Manjaro uh, is the company name. Of course, uh, talk about the data that got it approved. Well, I'm going to make short work of this, but I'll tell you there were five different trials that were done in people with diabetes. Of course, the f approval right now is diabetes. Do we hope it's going to get an obesity approval? Well, m well I'm, I'm going to ask you about that. Uh, we're going to look at the data here in a minute. And so diabetes, there, these, these trials, every company comes up with a name for their trials. And in this case, it's the uh, SURPASS trial, SURPASS 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. There's one called 6, 2, and I'm not going to say anything about it because it's not published, but the SURPASS 6 trial is the one that is going to look at cardiovascular outcomes. And you know that every drug has to have a cardiovascular outcomes trial. We don't have it yet. It's too early for for tercepatide or Manjaro. So SURPASS 1 is give the medicine in addition to diet and, and compare it to placebo diet. SURPASS 2 is give the drug and then compare it to one of the really good GLP-1 meds, Ozempic. SURPASS 3 is compare it to Traceba as initial, you know, that's the basal insulin, you know that. 
the basal insulin is first injectable. So either people on orals get the, the terzepatide monjaro or they get traceba as initial in, injectable. And then, and then there, there's a trial that compares uh, it to Lantus as first injectable or Glargine, you know. And then there's a trial, and that's the Surpass 5, that uh, actually gives it in addition to insulin. So it's been studied in pretty much every scenario. And, and let me just tell you, make a long story short, um, you know, do we want to go through all five of those trials? Oh, we do, but we don't. Uh, it would take too much time. I'd love to. But a actually, what, what happens here is you take people with A1Cs in the mid-8s and in and, and the surpassed 2 trial, for example. These are people who are on metformin alone and diet, and they're given either Onjaro 5, 10, or 15, and those are, the do those are doses that we can use compared to Ozempic. Now, they didn't have the Ozempic 2 milligram, that's the new higher dose, but they had the 1 when they did the study. So you compare uh, all those different doses added to the metformin, baseline A1C 8.3, what would you hope for if you add one more one medicine on top of metformin, and, and, and if the A1C is 8.3, just tell, ask your, you can answer yourself to yourself, what, uh, 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 there's I see a question, there's no evidence for teratogenicity. We don't have any data on PCO either, but we have data on diabetes, and that's about it right now. And so what happens if you add it? Uh, well, it turns out that the A1C reductions were like 2, 2.2, 2.3 at the three different doses, 5, 10, 15. Think about that. Think about that. Most of the time, most people tell me they'll be happy with a one-point drop. We're getting to 2.3, yeah, and that's really pretty good. And, and the group that was get, given Ozempic, the drop was also very good at 1.9. And so uh, that is uh, the, the bottom line there. And so uh, the rest of the trials showed very similar results, so really, really good drops in the A1C. And, and so what, what about the weight? What do you think is going to happen there? Well, I mean, how many pounds would you be happy with? Well, it, it turns out that the, the weight loss was quite substantial. And if you look at percent body weight lost, you know, we'd be happy with 5% body weight loss, right, from baseline? We'd be happy. That, help, that helps everything. But in, in, the, in one of the trials, uh, we're going to go back to that surpass two when you add it to metformin, and people weighed about 200 pounds. They lost up to, well, you know, the people that were on the 10 milligram dose lost about 9 point something percent of their body weight, 9 point something percent. And the people on the on the higher dose, uh, the 15, lost 11.2 percent, and and that you know that that was superior in that case to the to the you know the other the comparator. And really, when you look across the board in those trials, people are losing up to 10, maybe more percent of their body weight. This is mean, mean, and I don't mean like mean. I mean mean losses. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna glance over. I have a some information to the side here that we might be able to display when we put up the slides later. But, but actually, if you ask what percent of people on the 15 milligram lost greater than or, than or equal to 15% of their body weight, 15%, think about that, along with these improvements in the, in the glucose, it was 36% it was lost that much. And another really interesting income, uh, not income, outcome, it was an income too. But in one of the studies was, uh, if you look at the percent of people that had an A1C less than or equal to 6.5, like really good, also had a weight loss of greater than or equal to 10%, fabulous, and no significant hypoglycemia, uh, guess what percent that would be if you, if you had the percent of people on the 15 milligram that got all three of those uh, outcomes. Well, it was, it was 60%. 60% of people had the A1C, the weight loss that was over 10%, and, and then no, no uh, significant hypoglycemia. This is going to be a fun drug to use, and, and uh, it's going to be really great for our patients, and that's what it's all about. And, and one study showed that that weight loss was sustained. The Surpass 4, uh, which compared to insulin glargine, showed that the weight loss persisted for up to two years. So we do have longer term data. It's not like it goes down like a Nike swish and then back up, it, it stayed down. So that's, that's really, really good. And, and it turns out that, you know, we can slice and dice this about 100 ways, but uh, about 59% of people in the tercepatide, uh, on the tercepatide in the trials lost greater than or equal to 10% of their body weight. So in, in summary for this first part of the talk, Terzepatide is this one molecule, new class of drug, has a dual GIP 
and GLP-1 like effect. We've defined that, and and it, the, these these activities are probably at least complementary. They may be synergistic, and on, when it comes to various outcomes, including weight, and and uh, so we we saw really robust reductions in in A1C. 